In the 20th century, the most controversial issue in the church we're going to talk about today. It's not as controversial. By the way, we're in the 21st century, if you didn't know that. It's not the most controversial issue today, but it was back then. We're going to get into 1 Corinthians 14, and we're going to talk about this gift of tongues, this gift of prophecy, and we're going to discuss, you know, we talk about Vanguard as this Baptocostal church, this Baptist Pentecostal, Baptist charismatic church, and you say, why do we use that vernacular, that terminology? It is because of this passage and other passages and these two particular gifts that we believe both are still for today. So how does tongues and prophecy fit into Vanguard? We begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Paul writes this, Let love be your highest goal. Now, we'll come back to this today. But God wants us to know that our spiritual gifts are not as important as our love for God and our love for people. We're not to be on an ego trip. We're not to mistreat people. We're not to look down on them if they don't have a gift or they do have a gift or or whatever the case may be. We're to recognize that the spiritual gifts that God gives us, you ready? Is so that we can love people better. And if the gifts that God has given you is not being used to love people better the way God wants you to love them, then we're missing something. So how do tongues and prophecy fit? Principle number one, realize that tongues is not what matters most in the church. Realize that tongues is not what matters most in the church. Let's look at verse 1b. But also, desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the gift of of prophecy. So how do these fit into vinegar? Number two, we want you to desire tongues, but desire prophecy more. We want you to desire tongues, but desire prophecy more. Now, over the last 30 years, anybody that has come to me about this topic and has said, Pastor, can you guide me in this discussion? Yes, I would love to. Let me introduce you to the best book I've ever read on the subject. It's by Jack Hayford, who was senior pastor of the Foursquare Gospel in California, uh, in Van Nuys, California. He's gone to be with the Lord now. Uh, He actually, strangely enough, uh, was the special speaker at New Life on the day of the shooting that happened a number of years ago. Pastor Jack was speaking there that day. The book is called The Beauty of Spiritual Language, My Journey Toward, uh, excuse me, My Journey Toward the Heart of God. The challenge in this book is to ask God to give you the gift of tongues. You go, I would never do that. Right. And you should. You say, is he going to give it to me? I don't know. I'm not God. That's why you're not asking me for it. Ask God. What Paul is saying here is desire these gifts. So ask God to give you the gift of tongues. If you have never in your life asked God for this gift, I want to give you a challenge today. In the next seven days, set aside some time in your prayer closet, your prayer time, your Bible study, and say, God, if you have the gift of tongues for me, please give it to me. Please give it to me. Now, if there's something inside of you that says, I'm not going to do that, I would encourage you to figure out what that is and why you're so resistant to it. Because there are, there are things, listen, there are things that God is going to heal in people's lives through words of tongues 
that he will not heal any other way. And, and it is strange how God takes giftings and how God uses them to bring about healing in the body of Christ. And there are things that the Spirit, Romans says, utters and groans on our behalf that we do not understand. And it is okay to pray a prayer in tongues, in groanings, and say, Holy Spirit, can you translate this to the Father through the Son, the finished work of the Son that is seated at the right hand of the Father, and can you do a new work in me through this gift? I highly want to encourage you on that. And some of the stronghold in your life may be due to your resistance to what the Spirit has been wanting to do for some time in your life that you've been afraid to allow to occur because it's weird, it's strange, you can't control it. So why does our prophecy... Look at verse 2. For if your gift is the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking to God, but not to people. Since they won't be able to understand you, you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it'll all be mysterious. But one who prophesies is helping others grow in the Lord, encouraging and comforting them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally in the Lord. But one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Why especially prophecy over tongues? Let me give you four things here. Letter A, it helps others grow in the Lord. Letter B, it encourages others. Letter C, it comforts others. And letter D, it strengthens the entire church. Now, what do tongues do for the person speaking in tongues? It does four things. And you'll observe the theme here. It helps the person speaking grow in the Lord. Letter B, it encourages the person speaking. You see in the theme here, prophecy is big picture church. Tongues is personal relationship Jesus. Letter C, it comforts the person speaking. And letter D, it strengthens the person speaking. Verse 5, now I wish you all had the gift of speaking in tongues. Do you know who's talking here? The Apostle Paul. Okay, now I went to Dallas Theological Seminary, okay, and I love my seminary. I got an amazing education and training I had to study every verse of the Bible uh, before I could get my master's of theology. And so it was an incredibly uh, exhaustive and exhausting experience. It was wonderful. But my seminary, when we read verse 5, I wish you all had the gift of speaking in tongues. Do you know what they do with this verse? They ignore it. They ignore it. Not for today. And my seminary would say that this was temporary till the Word of God was complete. And now that the Word of God is complete, there is no need for the gift of tongues. That's what I was taught. But even more, I wish you were all able to prophesy. For prophecy is a greater and more useful gift than speaking in tongues. Unless someone interprets what you're saying so that the whole church can get some good out of it. Now, Paul's going to explain the chronological order of an interpreter. Look at verse 6. Now, dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you talking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you some revelation or some special knowledge or some prophecy or some teaching, that is what will help you. So, how how do these gifts fit into Vanguard? Number three, tongues will be practiced at Vanguard in a helpful manner. Tongues will be practiced at Vanguard in a helpful manner. Now, why is that? Let's look at verse 7. Now, even musical instruments like the flute or the harp, you may have played one of these growing up, or maybe you still do. And though they are lifeless and are examples of the need for speaking in plain language, for no one will recognize the melody unless the notes are played clearly. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know they're being called to battle? 
And it's the same for you. If you talk to the people in a language they don't understand, how will they know what you mean? You might as well be talking to an empty room. Now he's going to give an analogy in verse 10. There are so many different languages in the world, and all are excellent for those who understand them. But to me, they mean nothing. Yeah. I will not understand people who speak those languages, and they'll not understand me. I mean, have you ever been in a room where people are talking a language you can't understand? I mean, it's disconcerting, unnerving, intimidating, maybe irritating, and especially if they what? If they laugh. Oh, and if they look at you when they laugh. Verse 12, since you're so eager to have spiritual gifts, ask God for those that will be of real help to the whole church. So what does a helpful manner look like at Vanguard? Letter A, we practice tongues primarily as a private gift for the individual to be built up by God. That's from verse 4. Look at verse 13. So anyone who has the gift of speaking in tongues should pray also for the gift of interpretation in order to tell people plainly what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well, then what shall I do? I will do both. I will pray in the spirit and I'll pray in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit and I will sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in the spirit... How can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you're saying? You'll be giving thanks very nicely, no doubt, but it doesn't help the other people present. So letter B. The person who speaks in tongues is to ask God to give him or her the interpretation, the understanding, so he or she can share it with others. So, here's the million-dollar question. Will anyone speak a tongue out loud at Vanguard in our services? Verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Does it really say that? I mean, my seminary, do you know what they did with that verse? They ignored it. But in a church meeting, I would much rather speak five understandable words that will help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. So let her see. We will not practice tongues publicly in our weekend services. And there are at least three reasons why I will not practice tongues in our weekend services. And you can see these in your program. Number one, Paul says it's better to say words people can understand. Number two, we have prophecy, so let's use it. And number three, Paul says, don't use it where unbelievers are present. And I want you to know that rarely is there a service here at Vanguard in the weekend when we don't have people in the room like we do right now who do not claim the name of Jesus as their Savior. And we want to say things to you that make sense to you. And we want you, obviously, to have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. And we want to speak words that are understandable for you as you discern what God is saying to you. Now, verse 21. It is written in the, somebody say it, the what? The Scriptures. So whenever you see this phraseology in the New Testament, do yourself a favor and say, where is it written? Where is it written? Whenever Paul refers to something that's written in the Bible already, he wants you to go back to the context of where it was originally written. You say, what is this? This is called hermeneutics. You say, herma what? Hermeneutics is the study of the Bible. This is how you study the Bible. When you read that it says it is written in the Scriptures, you go, let's push pause there. Where is it written? So what we're getting ready to read is written in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. And here's what it says. I will speak to my own people 
Who's I? This is God talking through Isaiah. I will speak to my own people through unknown languages and through the lips of foreigners. And here's what he says. But even then, they, who's they? We'll unpack who they is in just a second. But even then, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So, verse 22 is, can be a super confusing verse if you don't understand the context of the verse before it. And the verse before it, you have to go back to Isaiah 28, 11 to understand the context of Isaiah 28. And you say, what was happening in Isaiah 28? Here's what was happening. The Hebrew-speaking prophets were speaking Hebrew to the Hebrew children, the Jews, Israel. And guess what they were doing? They weren't listening. They weren't listening. God will send people to talk to you in English. God will send prophets to talk to you in your native tongue. And God will say, here is an English word of prophecy from an English prophet. Listen. And like Israel, we ain't going to listen. We ain't going to listen. We ain't going to listen. So look what happens in verse 22. So you see, think of the context of what I just described to you. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. What is the context? The context is this, Isaiah 28, 11. What is the context of Isaiah 28, 11? It is a group of people who think they're believers and they're not. Because if you are a believer, you will listen to what God has to say. And they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't listen. And so God had to send foreign tongues, i.e. Babylon, to get Israel's attention that they were not listening to their own prophets who were representing their own God. And so the point here is this. There are times in which God speaks through foreign tongues to believing people so that he can let them know you're not believing. You're not believing. You're not a believer. And you're not getting it in your native tongue, and you're not getting it in any other tongue. And so there are times when God will speak a word through a tongue to someone who thinks they're a believer to show them that they are not. That's the context. Then he goes on to say, Now, prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. So prophecy, going back to Isaiah 28, is for people who hear the word in their native tongue from the prophets, and they actually believe it. Do you know what makes you a believer? You believe what God says. You believe God's word. That's what a believer is. And strangely enough, Strangely enough, in the time of Isaiah, in the time of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, who was led by the king Josiah, Israel was, and all of a sudden, guess what happened? A priest found a book in the temple, and he brought it and said to the king, you got any idea what this book is? They dust it off. We would call it the Bible. God's people had gotten so far away from God that they didn't even know that they were to read a book to figure out who God wanted them to be. Now, that never happens in any society like ours, right? Hmm. Hmm. Prophecy is for believers who who are believers. Now, he's going to shift. And I want you to see this shift in verse 23. Even so. If unbelievers or people who don't understand these things, now he's talking about real 
unbelievers that are not a part of our church, if they come into your meeting and they hear everyone talking in an unknown language, they will think, you crazy, man. you just crazy. You lost it all. So if we were to speak in tongues in this context and unbelievers that are present right now, they'd be like, you people are crazy. You've lost it. Now let's fast forward to verse 39 for a second. Don't forbid the speaking in tongues. Do you know what my seminary did with this verse? Ignored it. Just ignored it. Just pretend it's not there. Verse 20. Now, dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to an evil, but be mature and wise in understanding matters of this kind. So we'll practice these gifts in a manner that is mature, wise, and understanding. So what does that look like? Letter six. Tongues will never be a primary focus of our church because it's not a primary focus in the Bible. Tongues is for today, but it is not the primary focus of the church of today and the New Testament. Number five. That was number four. Number five. Tongues will be practiced only by those who are submitted to the elders. This is wisdom. If you believe you have this gift, we want to make sure that our elders know you have this gift and that you're not just on an ego trip and you're not just trying to cause confusion or chaos, but this is actually a gift God has given you. Number six, tongues will only be recognized where someone with the ability to interpret it is present. That is, small groups, midweek service. And just so you know, we do have key leaders in our church that have the gift of tongues. This is something that is a part of all of our church, uh, and it is something that we affirm, we believe in, and we support in its proper context. Now, verse 24, but if all of you are prophesying, and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they'll be convicted of sin. They'll be condemned by what you say, and as they listen, their secret thoughts will be laid bare. They'll fall down on their knees. They'll worship God, declaring God is really here among you. So now he's emphasizing the sharp nature of why the gift of prophecy is so important to the body of Christ. Number seven, the purpose of prophecy is conviction. The purpose of prophecy is conviction. In February of 2001, many of you know this story, so I won't belabor the point, but some of you may not. In February of 2001, I started waking up at 1.23 a.m. almost every morning. And when it first started, I was like, oh, this is weird. And you know, I highly encourage you to figure out if it's God or gas, okay, all right? And, and you can take care of one of those, all right? And I go back to bed. And it just kept happening. It kept happening. It kept happening. And so finally, I said, Tasha, I need to tell you something. And I had not written this down because it, I'd never had an experience like this before in my life, and I really didn't believe it was legitimate, to be honest with you. And... I started telling Tasha about it, and then eventually it got so uh, heavy that I told the Vanguard elders about it. And then eventually I went to uh, Pastor Ted Haggard at New Life Church in 2001, and I said, Pastor Ted, I need to tell you something. I need to tell you about a vision that God gave me, and he keeps giving it to me at 1.23 a.m. in the morning, and I need to tell you about this and I need you to tell me if it's of God or not. Please be kind to me. Please be gentle with me. If it's not, just tell me, and I'll move on. And Pastor Ted said, it's true. And then five years later, it all came out publicly. And what I want to tell you is, you know, there are people in our church that periodically in the city run into Pastor Ted. And 
in this process, you know, Pastor Ted will say things like, you know, uh, and he's gone through a second church and they've shut that one down and, and I'm not going to get into all of the finer nuances of what has taken place in the last 23 years. But what I do want to say is I have lived the gift of prophecy for the last 23 years of my life. Okay, and I would love to give it to you so I don't have to carry it. Because it may sound like an ego trip. Let me tell you, it will beat the life out of you, okay? Because here's what I want you to know about the gift of prophecy, and any gift for that matter. Uh, You don't get to divorce yourself from it on your day off. You don't get to take a break from it while you're playing basketball. Uh, You don't get to, while you're enjoying your favorite steak meal, forget that it exists and, and you don't get to, while you're down taking care of your cows, get to forget that it exists. It stays with you. It stays with you, and it stays with you. Now listen. God sent me to Pastor Ted for one reason and one reason only. You know what that is? He loves him. He loves him. He loves him. Remember? the first verse of this chapter. So if somebody comes to you and confronts you privately in your native tongue or in somebody else's, and it's clear to you, don't be offended by it. Don't be offended by it. Don't be offended by it. Ted said to me that day, would you lay your hand on my shoulder? Would you pray over me that God will give me the courage to do what he's asked me to do? Now here we are 23 years later and Ted has to go out late at night to walk in his neighborhood because he can't deal with the shame of people looking at him and saying the kind of things that he says to him because of the kind of things that he did. Listen, God can still redeem Pastor Ted and I'm still praying for that. But I want you to understand that if you think you have the gift of prophecy, I would encourage you, in the back of this book, there's a process that I walk you through to show you how to exercise this gift especially if God gives you a word about somebody else's sin. Now listen to me. Nobody's going to bat a thousand. Do you know what I mean by that? Like if you have the gift of serving, you're not always going to, Debbie, you're not always going to serve with the best heart and exactly the way God wants you to. But you have a wonderful gift of serving. Amen? Amazing gift of serving. You might have the gift of administration. You might have the gift of leadership. You might have the gift of teaching. You might have the, I mean, there's a whole list of gifts described in Romans and in Corinthians and so forth and so on. But you're not always going to exercise your gift exactly, perfectly correct all times. And so I highly encourage you, especially with these gifts that involve very sensitive areas of people's lives. And I want to illustrate this to you. When I was 18 years old, And I grew up all my childhood with my mother having the gift of prophecy, and she got to know things that I wish she didn't know because it was a tough sell. But when I was 18, I went off to Liberty University where uh, I love Liberty University. It was a wonderful school. It's where I met Tasha. And I was standing in the student center. Uh, This was in 1989. And all of a sudden, the Lord said to me in my spirit, You see that girl over there leaned up against the wall. I want you to go over there and tell her I forgive her for having an abortion. You ever gone off to college? You ever had your first day of college? Awkward, right? Socially uncomfortable. Fit in. Don't stand out. This is your chance. And so I say to the Lord, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, that couldn't have been of you. Now, over the years, I want you to know that the way that I know that God speaks to me personally is that, um, you ready? I don't want to do it. That's one of the ways I know he's spoken. Listen, if you're so eager to go tell somebody something like this, there might be something wrong with you. Okay? So, So check that one. So I was like, Lord, no, no, I'm not interested. No, no, thank you. Well, what happens is then there becomes a battle of the will. And my heart starts beating fast. And my hands start sweating and my feet start sweating. And finally I'll go, okay, I'll do it. And then I have peace. 
And so I walk over to this total stranger, and I say to her, her name was Michelle. I won't ever forget. She was a pastor's kid from the Northeast. And I said, uh, hi, my name is Kelly. She said, hi, my name is Michelle. And I said, hey, um, I know I don't know you, and boy, could you please forgive me? <laughs> uh, I, I just feel like there's something that I'm supposed to tell you, and um, I don't want to tell you. And if I'm wrong, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And she's like, okay. <laughs> so you can imagine. And I say to her, God wanted me to come over here and tell you that he forgives you for having an abortion. And she just started to weep. And she said, I am a pastor's kid, and I've never told my dad. I said, well, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time. And that's all the role that I played in that person's life. God didn't ask me to do anything else. And I want you to understand that the reason why he sent me to her, you, you ready? He loves her. And the reason why somebody will come to you privately to talk to you about secret sin in your life is because God loves you. He loves you. And if God sends someone to privately, especially if it's a total stranger, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Receive it immediately. The purpose of prophecy is conviction. Verse 26, well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize what I'm saying. When you meet, Pastor Melissa, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in an unknown language, while another will interpret what is said. But everything that's done must be useful to all and build them up in the Lord. This is not an ego trip. This is not a, a look at me, aren't I special in the body of Christ? That's not what this is about. So letter, uh, Roman numeral number eight, will practice prophecy. So what's it look like? Well, let's let two or three prophesy and let the others evaluate what's said. I had someone come up to me after the 9 o'clock service, and they said, Pastor, I want to ask you a question. Many years ago when I was an EMT, um, I went to the scene of a situation, and we put this woman on a, on a, uh, you know, a stretcher or a gurney, put her in the ambulance, and when I got up into the ambulance, this, this impression came over me that I was to tell her, I know that you're being abused, and we would like to give you somewhere to live. Imagine telling that to someone that's just been in a tragic accident, and you put them in the back of an ambulance, and it was all true. And his comment to me was, do you believe that God sometimes gives special gift revelation for seasons in people's lives or moments? Yes, I do. But I said, I would also challenge you, and I said his name. I said, I would also challenge you that maybe you've been ignoring a gift that God has given you. Huh? And maybe it's time to press back in and say to the Lord, Lord, if you've given me the gift of prophecy, we need prophets in the body of Christ. We need prophets in the body of Christ. You hear me? Because prophets will say what needs to be said, whether anybody likes them or not. It is, it is an important piece of the gifting. Now, be careful that you're not on an ego trip, right? Running around rebuking everybody. <laughs> Nobody likes people like that, right? Be careful. Verse 30. But if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation from the Lord... The one who's speaking must stop. Okay. In this way, all who prophesy will have to turn will have turn to speak, will have a turn to speak, one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Now remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can wait their turn. Like this is not a <laughs> this is not one of those things, oh, I just gotta get it off my chest now. No, let me encourage you. If you've got to get it off your chest now, please don't. Please don't. It's okay for a word to season a bit. 
For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all other churches. Now, here we go. Verse 34. Woo! You ready? Context, context, context. Okay? So let's read verse 34 the first time without context. Women should be silent during church meetings. Okay, let me say it another way. They ought to be seen and not heard. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive just as the law says. What, is that? what law is that? So we stop there. Verse 34 is one of those verses that's caused massive damage in the church because we don't read what's before it and we don't take time to read what's after it. So let's read what's after it. Verse 35. Now, if they, who, the women, have any questions to ask, you know, let them ask who? Oh, so the women we're talking about in verse 34 are wives. Have you ever met a woman that has a husband and isn't a wife? It's, you know, for it's improper for women to speak in church meetings. Now, how has the church traditionally interpreted this? Well, here's how it's interpreted. Women aren't allowed to preach. They're not allowed to speak. They can be seen and not heard. And, you know, they need to keep quiet. And, you know, if they have a question, go ask some man because I'm sure he's smarter than them. This is terrible. This is absolutely terrible. And it's, it's not Bible. It's not in the Bible, okay? It's not in the Bible at all. What is in the Bible? Well, let's unpack it. Verse 34. Women, which can also be translated wives, should be silent during the church meetings. It's not proper for them to speak. That is, for them to get out ahead of their husband in the context of church. Now, we talked about this a few weeks ago. If you want a strong church, have strong marriages. If you want a strong society, have strong families. The strength of the nuclear family will determine the strength of this country. And the strength of our marriages will determine the strength of this church. And so what is happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is that there are wives who are not respecting the spiritual headship of their husbands. So I say to young ladies when I get opportunity, uh, I say to them, uh, you want to marry this man? Yes. Well, are you going to follow him all your life? No. (laughs) Okay, well, that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible just, you go, well, I don't want to follow him. Then don't get married to him. Marry somebody else. Okay? The problem in 1 Corinthians 14, you ready? Now that I picked on you, ladies, the problem in 1 Corinthians 14 is the men were not leading. They weren't leading. You go, well, what does it mean to lead? Well, let's go back to Ephesians 5 where the pillar of marriage is. Do you know that marriage is supposed to be a symbol of the relationship that Jesus shares with the church? Wait. Wait. Jesus died. Jesus was crucified for the church. That's what the husband's supposed to do for the wife? Yeah. Yeah. He's supposed to be the lead servant. He's supposed to be selfless. He's supposed to serve his family, right? He's supposed to to be the leader by setting the example of serving. I'm taking a seminary class right now on the Gospel of John. I've been translating... uh, the Gospel of John from Greek to English, and pretty excited. And you might just see a series in uh, 2025 on the Gospel of John. Just a just a little sneak peek there. Um, and John chapter three is about the marriage supper at Cana. It's about a marriage. It's the first miracle that Jesus did. He turned water into wine. And I raised my hand. One of the very distinguished professors of Denver Seminary, where I'm attending right now, is Dr. Craig Blomberg. And I raised my hand. I said, Dr. Blumberg, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, uh, if, if the marriage in John 3 was a same-sex marriage, would Jesus have gone to it? Let me just tell you, that didn't go over real well in the classroom. 
How dare you ask such a question? You know, such an unloving question. Yeah, it's, it's like, no, I want to know the answer. I want to know the answer. Because could God have put a same-sex marriage in the Bible and shown us, given us an example to follow? And Because all of my pro-gay um, marriage pastor friends say this privately. I just wish there would have been one example in the Bible because the Bible is supposed to be an example you follow to show you how to have a relationship, but there's no examples in the Bible of same-sex marriages or relationships for that matter. So there's no example to follow. So if you decide to have a same-sex relationship, you have to find it devoid of the entire Bible. And so why would God, who created you and gave you the book to follow, why would He give you a book and not give you an example to follow? That seems kind of frustrating, doesn't it? So possibly the argument should be we shouldn't go that route. And it was interesting to hear his answer. And then Dr. Dotson and I, who he's been mentoring me and teaching me Greek, and he is a brilliant mind. I mean, the man, the man is just a brilliant mind. I've learned so much from him. Uh, I love everything about him except that he's an a Arkansas Razorback fan. So if you don't know why I hate that, then I can't help you with that. But... Um, so I said to him, Dr. Dodson, um, isn't marriage supposed to be about the modeling of the gospel? And he said, uh, well, yeah, I think so. And I said, have you ever gone to a same-sex marriage uh, a ceremony where the gospel got shared? Well, no, but I've never been to a same-sex marriage before, ceremony. He was like, and to be honest with you, I have most of heterosexual marriages, uh, ceremonies I've gone to, I don't hear the gospel told. I said, that's very unfortunate because marriage is for the purpose of showing to the world. The husband-wife relationship is for the purpose of showing the world the relationship that Jesus has with them, the church. And see, the reason why the redefinement of marriage is so damaging for the church is because we lose our ability to relate to God in the primary relationship that He has for us, and we lose these principles, and we lose our way relationally because of our sexuality. It's not about, oh, you're a terrible person, or you have an attraction, so you must be a terrible... No. No, I don't know if you know this or not, but Vanguard was started... Uh, with a lesbian couple, okay? That's, you just go, did you plan that? No, no, no. And these are very delicate and difficult and, 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 and very difficult things to deal with. But God wants us to protect the sacred relationship of husband, wife, which was what was being eroded in this passage because women were running out ahead. Wives were running out ahead of their husbands in the public context of meetings and was not being willing to show respect to the spiritual authority that they were to be in the home. Now you go, well, I don't agree with spiritual headship. Okay. You don't have to agree with it, but let me just tell you, it's biblical. It's biblical. And do you know what makes a person a believer? They believe the Bible. And, and you go, well, but I don't like certain things. Well, join my team. How would you like to have to get up and teach this stuff? Right? And then you become the object of people's wrath. But if I'm going to be obedient to what God's called me to do, I have to teach what God says, not what I want it to say. Amen? So if they have any questions, so here's the thing. God, ladies, and we talked about this in worship, God made it clear in 1 Corinthians 11 that women are to prophesy in church. Why would he take the time to say, ladies, when you prophesy, go about it this way in the church? <laughs> and then he's not going to say three chapters later, hey, everybody shut up. Okay, I mean, you've got to use some common sense here to a degree. And what was going on here is that they were not practicing 1 Corinthians 11. They were not functioning the way he had shown them to function and the way that God wanted them to function. And so it was improper for them to speak the way they were speaking out of turn the way they were speaking and showing a lack of respect for the spiritual authority of their husband. Ladies, listen to me. You do not need to submit to any man other than your husband. 
if you're an adult, okay? And please do not buy the lie that you are a second-class citizen, that you're less than... No, no. Do not buy that. Do not buy that. That is not of the Lord. Verse 36. Do you think that the knowledge of God's Word begins and ends with, your, with you, Corinthians? Well, you are mistaken. If you, <laughs> if you claim to be a prophet or think you're very spiritual, you should recognize that what I'm saying is a command from the Lord Himself. But if you do not recognize this, you'll not be recognized. So, dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Don't forbid speaking in tongues, but be sure that everything is done properly and in order. So, number nine, prophecy is to be practiced in submission with accountability and order. So what does that look like? Letter A, prophetic people are to submit their prophecies to others for assessment. It's good to have pause before you speak. And it is good to have accountability about words that God has given you. Letter B, prophetic people are to be accountable to what they say when they're right or wrong. So listen to me. Nobody bats a thousand. You're going to get it wrong from time to time. But when you get it wrong, what do you do? Do you excuse yourself? Do you pretend you didn't do something, didn't say something that was wrong? When you say something that's wrong, here's what you say. I was wrong. I was wrong. Remember all those prophets in 2020? God has said Donald Trump will be president in 2020. Oh, it's 2024. He still isn't. So they were wrong. Okay? You go, yeah, but they, I wish they would have been right. Oh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what is. And if you speak a prophecy that's wrong and you don't take ownership of it, guess what? It will show up in your life. God will turn it back on you. You better take this very seriously. If you want to speak for God, <laughs> then get ready to take what comes with that. And if you miss it, Take ownership of that. Have enough humility to take ownership of that. Have enough humility to walk it back, okay? Or you will bring that very word on your own life. Be very careful. That's what accountability is. Let us see. Prophetic people are to do things with proper order. Proper order. And it's okay for a word to season. I talk about that in the 23 book. It is okay for a word to season. Just be careful that you're not letting it season because you don't want to be obedient. Right? Make sure that you're going through the process. And listen, going all the way back to 01 with my wife. Honey, what do you think? She's like, I think you should take this to the elders. To the elders, what do you think? I think it's time to take it to Pastor Ted. Okay, I took it to Pastor Ted. Pastor Ted said, this is a true word. Okay, he affirmed it. And then he denied it. And then I took it to his elder board. And his elder board didn't do anything with it. And so we had to wait five years. And now here we are. Take prophetic words seriously. Take them seriously. Take them seriously. But when you're wrong, take the fact that you're wrong seriously, and say, that doesn't take away that I have this gift. It just means I didn't get it right here. And don't give up. Hear me on this. You say, what is, what is a prophetic word you know is not of God? Here's one that's not of God. You suck and you should quit. That's not of God, okay? God's not trying to bring a, a spirit, a critical spirit, through the gift of prophecy to get you to stop being obedient to serving Him. And at some point, you have to shut out words of prophecy that hinder the effectiveness of you doing what God has called you to do. And I want you to know that God's not up in heaven going, well, they didn't pass on that scorecard, so out with them. No, God is wanting to use your life, grow your life, and help you become mature in the gifts that he's entrusted to. Don't give up on these gifts, but let's use them properly. Amen.